I'm back again, guys, with another wonderful person. I am Shia Sokari, and this is Vibe It and Stuff, where I have thought-provoking conversations with different people that I know, with different friends. And so today, I have a wonderful accountant based in the Houston area named Albert Okagbue. So, um, Albert, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Albert Okagbue. As she said, I'm a CPA in Houston. I've been practicing in Houston a little over a decade. Oof, a decade. Isn't it crazy how time just goes? Like, we're like... <laughs> Whether you like it or not. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And um, so um, Albert and I met at a Nigerian American Multicultural Council volunteer panel uh, where we talked about our careers with young kids and then that led into him doing my t taxes for me. Um, and then now I feel like it's just important for us now to kind of see who the business owners in our area are and people that can help support us in our growth as entrepreneurs, as young professionals, as older professionals, whoever you are watching this. Um, so how have you been during this whole quarantine season that we're going through? It's, well, it's disruptive to say the least. Um, people, so a CPM considered at least defined in Houston, I think we're considered essential by most cities. Okay. But, but your staff may be living in a place where they have to be quarantined. So mm. if, you have, if you have team members who live with senior citizens or in an area with a lot of senior citizens, they may have to stay home because those are high risk people. So it's just been a disruption. For one thing, having to learn and set up the infrastructure to work from home. Right now I'm chatting with you over an internet connection at my home, which is considerably less reliable than the one in my office. Gotcha. So even though the one in my office has a quote unquote slower speed, it's business class versus consumer class. And this one is, this one times out. So it's just a lot of disruption for me in terms of getting work done. And then you have a lot of clients who are going to lose their business if they don't do something and you're trying to help them out as much as you can uh, during a busy season. So it's, it's one for the books. To say the least, to say the least, you know? And so like you brought that up, your um, clients that, you know, may have to run into losing their businesses. Um, how have you seen this whole small business loan program? Um, what have you seen with that as an accountant? What have you seen? So many, there, there are a lot of issues, right? You have a large amount of money that the government is trying to get out, but they can't seem to get it out fast enough. You know, who is going to get it out? Uh, you have issues where banks are issuing these loans, but there are a couple of challenges that I've seen people run into. Some loans, uh, and this is not all loans, but some loans or in some situations or at some point in the process, because this thing keeps changing, you, you, you can't apply if you don't have a prior relationship with the bank. So you have a lot of banks who said you can't apply with us if you don't have a prior lending relationship. Well, most small businesses aren't necessarily borrowers. And then at some point they had to uh, loosen it up and say, you can't apply with us if you don't have a prior relationship at all. And then you have situations where you want a certain unique type of loan and you can't apply for that if you don't have a prior relationship with the, or the bank that does that kind of loan. And it's just, it's, it's just moving chairs and, uh, and it's very difficult for a lot of people. I, I know that some people have gotten money I don't think that I know of any of my own clients that have gotten money yet uh, because at the beginning they started issuing money. This is from what, what a banker told me it's the, the they started issuing the money. And then at some point they just got slammed with applications. And so a lot of loans are pending because again, SBA doesn't is, is short staffed. It's not prepared for this. Nobody's really <laughs> prepared. For, no one really prepared for this. So, so I think it's been very hard getting the money. I've, I've started to hear about people getting stimulus checks for individual tax based yeah. on individual tax returns. I've heard about that this week, but it's, it's hard. Um, it's hard getting the money into the hands of people. That's the first thing. And, and I'll just add the other thing is then people have to ask whether they should be borrowing money to keep their businesses afloat. And many people just won't do it. Mm. That's that's a very good point. That's a good point because there's there's a whole thing about it being forgivable and and not and 
people are yes and and there's the one that's forgivable if you use it for payroll they call it the payroll protection program but the challenge with that though is do you have work for these employees to be doing are you going to hire people or keep people on and pay them to do nothing if the business has gone away temporarily and if you're going to pay them to do nothing how does that really work how do you recoup it so it's you know it's i think there are gaps so i think that's the best way to describe it there are many gaps this will help a lot of people but there are many gaps in the people that it won't help or it can't help for whatever reason because at the end of the day not every business in fact many businesses can just don't have the kind of margins where they can borrow money and then when they get back into business they can comfortably pay it back i know the terms are really good but but business owners are are nervous about that and then um and then some businesses have just you know if your business has dropped 50% or more it's hard to you can't help that person very much by giving them a loan because the customers aren't there right exactly so it's like once you get this loan and your business is back in business how are you how long is it going to take you to recoup and get a profit from your business once because you've taken out this loan and we're doing yeah yeah how long for so long and they weren't working so how do you get that it's a really challenging time you know and so um so as far as your clients who are your um main demographic of accounting clients i know you've told me you work with primarily entrepreneurs in real estate is that still kind of the case or yeah that's still the case most of my clients look like both of us (laughs) but um you know most of my clients are between 20 and mid 40s almost all of them i have so i do i have different buckets okay so i have the people who invest in real estate i have the people who have a business or own a business And I have retirees, retired teachers, nurses, uh, people on pensions. There's a there's a few unique quirks to their taxes that sometimes just good, better service serves them better. And so those are different buckets. But I think the biggest core of my client base are people who are serious about accumulating wealth. They're, They're usually opportunists. So. They dabble in a little bit of everything I just described. And if something is a good deal, they'll generally do it. So you have some people who, uh, one client was talking to me about all these loan programs and literally has, I think, four or five businesses to apply for, to think about what what stimulus to get for each. (laughs) It's a lot of businesses to have, you know, and uh, some of those businesses are shut down right now. Some are still Mm -hmm. operating. So that's, that's you know I, I think i'm i'm what they call a main street account you know my my wealthiest client you see him in the street you wouldn't know that's the kind of people that i work with okay okay awesome and um what made you choose to get into accounting as a career like was this something you knew as a child or how did you get into accounting <laughs> yes it is something it is something i would honestly I, it's a, it's it's actually a spiritual thing for me so I had, I had never met an account. I don't think there's no one in my family, my immediate family, who my parents have never had an account. At a certain point, I grew up in Zimbabwe. So I was in Zimbabwe as a young kid. And okay. at a certain point, you kind of have to pick a path, you know, whether it's going to be science or going to be business or, some, or art, you know, you kind of have to pick a path. So around 14, I decided, um, I decided, or I would say it was revealed to me that my, I need to help businesses, right? Or help people with businesses. So the only two careers I ever considered was law and accounting. Hmm. And I just decided to do accounting and have been basically on that track from 14 to my first job at 24 to just being here. And then, and then my decision to go into my own practice is mainly kind of a desire to be useful to people that like the people that I know. Mm. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with working for very large businesses, but that's not what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I wanted to help people go from, go from nothing to something. And so that's why I'm in the space that I'm in now because I get to see and 
I get to see people go from, you know, making 20 or 30,000 a year to making 200,000 a year or, or go from having a hundred thousand dollars to having a million or two. It's, it's, it's kind of not, it's very good to see yeah. people progress that way and to help them do that because that's their, that's their livelihood. So the difference between the businesses that, you know, big businesses and businesses I deal with is every business I deal with is somebody's livelihood. Mm. If that business uh, doesn't do well, there is one family that, you know, maybe they can't live as well as they, they used to live uh, as opposed to dealing with a major business where yeah, yes, the, the CEO, CFO and all those people, they're going to be fine anyway, regardless of what happens, they're going to be fine. You know, it's just a completely different space. That is so awesome. That's awesome. And that, that is amazing that you never had, you know, you didn't know an accountant and somehow it just was like, okay, this is where I'm going to go. You and know? this, and that's why we met. That's why I was at the event where we met. Right. Yeah. That's why uh, when I have a chance to talk to people about accounting, I do that. I know in America, I believe less than 3% or so of all CPAs in America are black. Uh, mm. Younger people are not doing it as much as the, as much as older generations did. And what I found out is that generally people will pick a career of someone they've met. So by I've heard that at some point that by age of 16 or something like that, most people have met someone in the career that they want to go into or their parents have recommended it. Someone they respect has recommended it. Yeah, that wasn't the case for me. Uh, till today, I think people, people, who, uh, people in my family... I don't, I'm not sure that they fully understand <laughs> the choices because it just came out of nowhere. But <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And so you talked about like wanting to like help people build wealth, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think the foundational things that somebody that's looking to um, grow in a business should understand as far as um, the foundations of building wealth? Okay. Um, well, Building wealth via business is a much longer and more winding road with nasty creatures that come out and eat chew, chew parts of your body parts. <laughs> but if you want to talk about that, I think the, if you're, so, you know, if you're a solo or you have a business in any way, shape or form, you have to have a pipeline, right? That's the number one thing that people, I think people don't understand. What are you doing? What do you do? that makes people come and pay you to do what you do. You have to have something. It, the, the beauty of a small business is it really doesn't take much, right? It, to be honest, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take a lot of work. I don't need to be the most famous, you know, account in Houston. It doesn't take that many people to keep me, um, keep my livelihood. So, but you have to have a pipeline. You have to have something that you're doing at the very beginning. And when you have a, when you've done a lot of work for a lot of people, that can be what sustains you. But at the very beginning, you have to figure out what you're going to do to kind of build up that group. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is you don't get to keep all your money. You have to pay taxes. So you have to have records that are good enough so that you can pay taxes. And at the point when you start making a significant uh, living, you have to plan for making tax payments along the way. Um, I generally will recommend, for example, someone who makes 50 to 100,000 a year in their business. Different businesses vary in terms of what the profit would be, but I tend to recommend to those people to save a third of their money. I tend to say, save a third of your money and you probably will have enough money to pay taxes or you won't be short by a lot. Um, and when people are making like more than 100, I would generally recommend save half of your money um, and you won't pay half of your money in taxes. But at this point, you're actually building wealth because every year you have more money than you had the, the year before. So just you have to save money. You have to pay taxes along the way. Uh, between those two things, I mean, there are a lot of other things, but uh, taxes can discourage people from being in business. And if people don't have a good enough pipeline, there's just no hope in, in some ways, you know. That's, that's what's happening now. When you make everybody stay at home, you're cutting off people's pipeline. I mean, how many times have you gone to Starbucks and you didn't really mean to go to Starbucks, but you were just in that part of the, the city or you were shopping in the store next door 
you know, that's part of their pipeline is having this expensive storefront that they have because people see them and think about coming in to get a drink. So, or just use the Wi-Fi and then you get a drink. <laughs> exactly. So right now, by people staying home, we're cutting off people's pipeline. So right. you know, it's, I think, I think I would say that if you can't uh, successfully attract people for what you do, then you should be attracting people for somebody else and getting paid for it. Mm. Uh, that Because many times people are good at something but they're not good at attracting people who want to pay for that service. And so they struggle and they always wonder what's going to happen. Unfortunately, you know, the best, the most successful businesses in any category that we know are the ones that attract customers, attract and retain customers the best. I think that's, that's, that's good information right there, you know, and I feel like, um, no matter what the business is going to what you're saying about the pipeline, it's like, no matter what, um, our businesses, um, whatever anybody has a business in, we're, we're selling something. So mm -hmm. pipeline is something in sales. So whether you may be an accountant or a Starbucks, have a coffee shop or a clothing line, it is the, the act of selling a product. So mastering the skill of sales for a business owner can help build wealth, you know, is, is, is and, 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 and for anybody who hears this and gets scared about sales, I'm going to say it a little more softly. Mm -hmm. You need to know who wants what, you're, what you have. Right. You don't have to think about convincing people exactly. to want what you have. You need to know what they look like, who they are, where they are, where to find them, because, you know, somebody's going to choose you. Right. To do that right. for them, for the, for some reason that comes out of your mouth or from somewhere else. But if you're not where the people who need it can find you, you're kind of you're, you're not you're not in the race. Right. So I think that's that's very important. Eighty percent of businesses make less than one hundred thousand a year in revenues, mm -hmm. which means that many people who have their own business are not making that good of a living. And that's not that's not an encouraging stat. So. Yeah. But anybody who can make fifty or sixty thousand can make a hundred and fifty. Hmm. Yeah. One thing they say is your vibe attracts your tribe. You know. So. Hmm. You know. So it's it's putting out that vibe that can attract hmm. the tribe. You know. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah. I write that down. <laughs> yeah, your vibe attracts your tribe. You know, this is We Vibe Network, so. <laughs> now I know how the name because <laughs> how the name how something about the name. Yeah, vibrations. You know, hmm. energy. We're all energy. We're all vibration. So how do we attract vibes that, that are good for us, you know? Okay. So I asked a couple um, friends of mine that I was like, what would you ask an accountant if uh -oh. uh, you were talking yeah. to them? Let's do this. <laughs> and so one friend was like, he wants to understand um, how can he save money and invest money um, with a quick turnaround? The quick turnaround. Um, I don't know what a quick turnaround means, but that's not really, that's not realistic. Um, so there's very few ways for you to make meaningful amounts of money quickly uh, if you're working with money. So if you go to the bank and you put it in a CD for a year, you earn higher interest than you put than if you put it in a CD for a month. You don't just earn a higher dollar amount; you earn a higher interest rate. So that's the first thing is I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah. I think that when it comes to money, generally slower is better. Uh, and slower is more painful, requires more discipline. But that is why most people, that's part of why most people don't succeed is because most people want it in a hurry. And those who can persist, those who can wait will do better uh, in the long run. So I would avoid anything, any, any financial opportunity that starts with, uh, makes any comments about speed. Uh, mm. I would be very skeptical about that because I don't know. So I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you. I mean, I've worked with, you know, and talked to maybe a few hundred, not a lot of people, but a few hundred people and who I've, I have good visibility to how their money, where they got their money from, how they made it, how much of it was inherited, how much of it was a business, you know, that sort of thing. 
and it always takes a while. It always takes a while. And so if, if someone starts a business today and they're a millionaire in five years, you have to, you look closely and you realize it took them maybe 10 years to get to where they were when they started the business, right? Maybe they spent time in school or something else. So it always takes a while. That's just, you know, the average, the average millionaire is about 50 some years old. It always takes a while. I think that that's a great point. You know what I mean? I feel like, um, in our millennial society, this McDonald's society, everybody's looking for a way to kind of get quick stuff. And it's almost um, impossible to do anything quick, just as quick as it comes, is as quick as it can go, you know? Yes. And that's what so, we have to kind of. I'll add one more thing. Some of it is about discipline, right? So just like you said, easy come, easy go. Sometimes when, when it comes fast, you don't have enough time to fully digest where it came from, why it came. And so it's very easy to be wrong about it. It's very easy to be wrong about if you make, if you normally make $50,000 a year and for whatever reason this year you make 100, 150, it's very easy to be wrong about what actually made that happen. And so, because we're all, we're all running this kind of scientific experiment. It's not really scientific, but we're trying to be scientific. Uh, about what we believe causes the things in our lives. Right? Mm. So the things that happen quickly, we don't get enough time to digest them to really get a, have a, a better workable answer for what's causing them. But mm. if something takes five years, 10 years, you really get to have a sense of, okay, I did this here and 12 months later, that happened. I talked to that person and eight months later, this happened you really start to make those connections. So slower is ultimately better. And then I'll say as far as the generation, I think people, people just don't know how long things take because people don't talk about what they're working on when they start it. They mm. usually talk about it when it's become clear that it will succeed. So, mm. and, and at that point, there are, few, there are few years from the finish line. So, but if some, if someone started a business today, you know, look like, you know, look, you, you're on social media. If you look at social media and things like that, you know, many of the quote unquote gurus, we only hear about them after they're successful. We mm. don't get to hear about them when they're starting because they're busy working. So they're not talking. So we, I think many times when we think something didn't take a long time, we have the clock wrong in terms of when they actually started it. They actually started it a lot earlier than we think. It's just, you know, we weren't aware of that and, um, and we just kind of make up our minds uh, on it. And there's, a, there's also a culture of a lot of people who want you to believe that you can do everything they can do. And I don't want to stress this out, but I want to say this, I think is very important. I think that very successful people are either humble, or dishonest. Hmm. Okay, uh, I'm not going to say uh, which one okay. in each case, but they're either humble or dishonest. Okay. Uh, if they if they are humble, they underestimate how hard they have worked, um, what they had in terms of you know um, luck, parents, connections. They underestimate a lot of things if they're humble, and so they want you to believe you can do what they've done because they really do believe that, but that's because they underestimate what they've done. And, or they are dishonest, and I'm not gonna say what percentage is, you know, they're dishonest in the sense that they know those things, but they don't want to say that because they don't want you to think that they don't deserve what they have, right? So if you, if you start out your business, if you get a record deal or something like that, because you know your best friend from high school starts a record label and the record label becomes successful you may not ever <laughs> say that this is someone you've known since you were a kid right my point is people may never say that mm -hmm. but that's very important if you're trying to tell someone the true story of how comfortable somebody has to be with another person to give them this kind of opportunity right that's very that's a big piece of information but i think a lot of people they um they don't want to they want to believe that anybody can be what can achieve what they've achieved so they miss that 
And then you have the other people who maybe they're trying to sell you a program of how you can get to where they are. And so they just completely skip those things because they don't want you to think, oh yeah, she, she's just successful because she knows somebody. Mm. You know, like that's, the, that's one of the easiest ways to completely kill somebody's credibility or at least attempt to kill credibility. To say, oh, they just made it because they know somebody. You, that know? Make, you bring that up. I'm not saying that this program is the case for it when I say mm -hmm. this. But like, you know, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad program, like okay. Robert mm -hmm. Kiyosaki. I'm familiar with that. The real estate investing programs. A lot mm -hmm. of times, you know, People go to those and think, okay, why am I not able to do what they have done? But there are, he talks about he had the rich dad. The, and with that rich dad, there was connections that he made and opportunities that- Oh, he, he does talk about that? Well, he talks about the rich dad in his book. Okay. So, oh, okay, I meant the connections. No, he didn't talk about the connections. Yeah. But one would have to think about, okay, so this man has connections in the world yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And we all have the ability to make connections with people and build relationships mm -hmm. and things like that to grow us in different ways. However, I think it's something to say about the slow, the slow um, growth because um, it may be take generations of relationship building to acquire, you know, a certain level of, of achievement, you know, and yeah. you know, your children. And, 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 and think about it like this. The reason why I mentioned that comfort level is that, you know, it, um, you can't, you can't meet somebody on the, it's very rare that you go out on a date with somebody on the first date and then you decide to get married the next day. It's, it's very unusual. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure it happens. Uh, somebody has done it. Indeed, but, right. you know, and, and even when people talk about, let's, in fact, I'll give you a flip side. Even when people talk about, say, arranged marriages and some in different cultures, when people talk about an arranged marriage, you're talking about an arranged marriage between two people whose parents have known each other for 30 years. Right. You know, or who's, you know, or whose parents come from the same town. So it's like you two just met, mm -hmm. <laughs> but everybody else <laughs> no. is backing you up that's going to be there when you have fights and arguments has known each other forever. So I think, you know, especially in, in financial business, like my business, there's, it's very, there's, there's sensitive information. There's this sensitive. Uh, I know more about many of my clients than just about anybody else on the mm. planet, to be completely honest with you. Um, so you, that comfort level, you have to, you have to build up to that comfort level in many cases. And even if you're, trusted with it because of like a professional designation or or something like that uh you still have to sustain it you know right uh, and so that's still that all takes time that all takes lots and lots of wonderful time that's very true <laughs> very true so, so now i have a question for you this is mm -hmm. i'm going to move on to another area so yeah. um these are so with this question you know about saving and investing i'm going to go a little more into the saving side okay um, how can an undisciplined person practice the task of budgeting? Oh, yes. Uh, wow. Well, the good news is that you live in the 21st century and you have apps, you have tools, you can automate banking. So when I do, I will, I will share with you one thing that I help people do. I've done some financial coaching. It's usually for a couple um, uh, or a, um, a, it's usually for a couple okay. and it's usually one person that is self-employed. So that's an interesting thing. It's usually a couple where one person is self-employed. Okay. And one of the things you have to do is first, you have to budget off the right numbers. Many people set a budget, but their income is not what they think it is. So even if they stick to that budget, they fail. Okay. Second, you have to Wait, wait, so what do you mean by that? By that, so, you know, if, if you're going to budget 50000 a year because your salary is 50000 a year, that's wrong. Your $50,000 salary is pre-tax. Okay. So I don't know if you can still see me here. Yes, my, computer, my computer is doing things. It just popped <laughs> up something. So $50,000 is pre-tax. So that's not your actual salary. That's not the number you should budget off of. Okay. okay. So that's one. And then number two... Um, you need to understand the differences between diff bills. So 
there are types, different types of people. Some people like to spend money. Shayo, I don't know if you know, you've heard this before. Some people like to spend money. Okay. Some people, uh, some people like to hold on to money. Okay. Okay. Those are distinct personality orientations. Call them that. You 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 get it from life experience, from how you are, from your worries, your fears, all that sort of thing. A lot of people are wealthy because they're just not comfortable. Part. Uh, giving up money. It's not because they're more responsible than everybody else. Okay. So, so you need to know where you are. Okay. Mm-hmm. Some people have to learn how to spend because they don't ever give up their money. So they eventually have to learn how to spend. So if you are somebody who spends, then you have to keep money away from yourself. <laughs> it's very simple. Keep money away. I just gave someone a, a client, a huge tip a while ago that so I am someone who likes to spend. So what I do whenever I have money, I buy all the stuff around the house. You buy all the stuff around the house? Yes. I buy all the things. We, I buy most of our groceries. Oh, that's what you mean. I just, because, because I like to buy people things, right? Okay. So, so my brain doesn't know that I'm doing the right thing because I'm buying people's stuff. I'm buying my kids' food. I'm buying my wife's food. I'm buying my, what we're going to eat. And when I'm done you know, or I pay our bills and things like that. So I feel like I'm spending money. I'm tricking myself. Uh, It's, it feels great because I'm buying all this stuff, you know, but it's all stuff we're going to have to buy anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. And so a lot of people, you know, so you have to know yourself and then you kind of work that trick that helps. Um, One more thing. There are many, many, many things that'll come up, but one more thing I'll share is uh, I already hinted at keeping money away from yourself. So, for example, if you have $5,000, but you have $4,000 in bills, why should you even ever look at a bank account with $5,000 in it? You should only be looking at a bank account with $1,000 in it. Because okay. that's, mon- that's the money you actually have to spend. Okay, you know? so if you have $5,000 cash and you have $4,000 mm-hmm. in bills, you should only be looking at $1,000. Yeah, you should, you should have all your money in the account for bills separate. You know, this is, this is 2020. It's not expensive to have multiple bank accounts. So you should have a bank account for bills separate so that when you look, the account that you look at, like we all know this, you, ha- you know the account you look at to find out how much money you have to spend this weekend. You know what account that is. Mm-hmm. That account should only have what you should actually be spending. Mm-hmm. It, shouldn't have, it shouldn't have a penny more. It should have only what you should actually be spending. So that when you look in that account and it says $100, you can spend all of it. If it says 1000 you can spend all of it. As opposed to maybe you buy, you, you overdo it. Uh, because you overdo it thinking maybe something else will happen and then you miscalculate and it just goes down. So that's another one. And the last thing I'll suggest is, um, so first, budget off the right number. Second is the don't, don't have access to money that you shouldn't have access to in the first place. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing I'll suggest is understand the difference between two types of expenses. Um, I wrote a book many years ago in 2013 where I put this in there for the first time. Um, there are two types of expenses that I think matter. You have your monthly expenses, the ones that happen every single month. And then you have what I call your, your wish list. Um, and your wish list is the expenses that happen less frequently than that, typically once or twice a year, or the ones that you can control when you do it. So, you know, you want to go to Aruba for vacation. You don't put that in your monthly budget. You only budget for your monthly bills. And then you have this wish list of things that if you have money, you'll do them. But if you don't have money, you'll be fine. So many times people mix the two up. People set up a budget that doesn't factor in that the car will break down. You don't know when it'll break down, but it'll break down, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So at some point, you know that you want to go on a vacation. You don't be, some people might budget $100 a month towards a vacation, but I think it's more of, I need to do this vacation. Here's how much money I need to spend on it, but here's how much I actually need to spend on my bills. And the money for my bills, uh, only what I need to pay my bills goes into that account. And all the other money goes somewhere else. And I'll figure out later what to do with that money, right? 
So that's just one way, but the basic idea is automation. So we're mentioning names here for, for mentioning names of people who have written about this. Automation is a big idea for uh, Ramit Sethi, who wrote, I will think I will teach you to be rich many years ago. Um, automation is a big idea. Like in my view, it's the biggest idea that I've seen from everything he, he has that I've, that I've seen is automation, automating accounts, moving money away. Um, so I would do that. Uh, I would definitely do that. But, you know, there's a couple of other things. And it gets way more complicated if you're in a relationship with someone. Mm, mm. I, I believe that because that's two different spending habits coming together and unifying. If it is two different spending habits, but two different lifestyles. For sure. Two different spending habits, two different lifestyles, two different sets of uh, financial goals, two different sets of financial f- worries and fears two different sets of families and friends. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And so let me, we might have to have another video where we have different conversations and subtopics over time. But um, so, sure. you know, how do you suggest we set ourselves up to have a successful financial future? You know, and I know what you kind of talked about just now kind of went into some of that, but going a little more, deep, a little deeper on how do we set ourselves up, whether we're an entrepreneur, whether we're W-2 employee, how do we set ourselves up for a successful financial Ooh, I'm, make, I'm making faces because I'm trying to figure out what, what piece to give you. Hmm. And um, you can give a couple pieces, you know? Um, uh, I, think, I think the pipeline comment applies to anyone who needs to earn money. Okay. Whether it be an uh, W-2 Entrepreneur, or- doesn't matter. I, I, in, my, in my opinion... One of the flaws, one of the traps that employees fall into um, that any successful entrepreneur has overcome, whether they think about it or not, is that most employees, I think, in my opinion, I've been an employee before way back, cannot name five people they know who have the ability to hire them at their (laughs) current pay level. They don't know. They can't name them. People only start meeting people who can hire them when they need a job. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think just, it has to be part of your regular professional existence to know a handful of people in different companies who can give you a job because you don't know when you'll need one. That's good. That Uh, can go for music business, you know, go for real estate. That's a good one. So many, many, you know, if you're, if you're, so if you're watching this and you're in a corporate job and you're wondering why uh, so-and-so is always on the committees for this or that, or you're wondering why that other person is on that nonprofit board. And, you know, we all have a lot of ways of doing a lot of things, but people get out and do things where they will be doing them with other people that can add value to their lives. So as far as the the pipeline thing is probably the biggest one because you can't save if you can't earn money consistently. Many people earn good money, but in times like, like we're facing this year, they will draw down their savings, mm-hmm. right? Because their ability to find a job fast enough is, is, is severely, uh, is weak. They can't mm-hmm. find a job. When you say, when you say someone, it, it'll take six months to 12 months to find a job, <clears throat> That's a long time. Most people, even if they have savings, that will put a huge dent in your savings if you have to be unemployed for six months. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, now some jobs are so complex that it takes twelve months before you even find a job and start interviewing and all that. But usually, those jobs pay so much that you should you should already be like have a war chest, you know, and maybe a severance and sign on bonuses and things like that. But uh, so I think the pipeline is, is huge. You have to, you have to, you have to know right now, you know, if, if God forbid, I didn't have anything to any way to make a living, you know, I know who I would call. I know what list of people that I would call. And I would say, you know, here's the situation. I'm just, you know, I'm, I have some capacity. I could take on more work and I know, how that's going to work out just based on history. I know who those people are, you know? Uh, so when you talk about pipeline for W2 employees, resumes, I get resumes for people trying to work for me that are 
honestly horrible. Um, people have resumes that don't really present them as people that you should hire. And uh, one more thing I'll say on this is that your resume shouldn't just be about saying what you do. It should be so good. Understand, you have to have a resume that looks so good, it's so well written, it's so beautiful to the eye that somebody receives it and cannot help themselves but give it to somebody else. Right. Mm. So so if I get a resume, you know, I should I should look at it and go, man, what other CPA do I know who might want to hire someone? Like mm. because this this candidate is too good to to just pass up, right? So I'll look, put that down. But once you're earning enough money, then you have to save some of it. I think that people need to realize that if you're not saving 20% of your money, 20, if you're not saving about a quarter of what you earn in a year, you will have to work all, you know, 30 or 40 years. Mm. Uh, it's not a bad thing, but most people just don't know that they just don't know that, you know, and the average person, you talk about real estate investors, you talk about like the Kiyosaki world. I, I don't remember uh, the Kiyosaki world being one where savings is talked about as much. That's more of a Dave Ramsey thing. Dave Ramsey, yeah. But the reality is in my experience, my clients who managed to accumulate a significant positive net worth and, you know, 10, five or 10 years or so are saving a quarter to half of their income mm. on a regular basis, mm. which is extreme. It's very extreme. It sounds extreme, but if you're going to graduate uh, college today and you realize that to get rich, essentially, you need to figure out how to save half of your income, I think your first car and your first apartment would be different. Mm. And so I think that you know, everyone should work towards that, uh, work towards that living on half of your income target. Um, and, and there's many, there's many in between spots. If you have debt and all, there's many in between spots, but everybody needs, needs to understand that, you know, people who have a lot of money have ridiculously high savings rates. I don't care if it's Jay-Z or Bill Gates. They, they make a hundred million dollars and you'd be amazed. They spent 10. Right? Okay. That's just, they have really high savings rates. So with that savings, like, do you do you feel like people should put it in a savings account and put it in the CD money market? Like, what do you from you observing? Where are you? It, it depends. You know, I think everyone should define their wealth strategy. So you in your case, you know, for example, not you don't have to answer, but you need to define what is going to make me go from someone who works for money. Mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't have to work to have money right? right what am i gonna do and when you're younger i think that you dabble you can dabble here and there and i think that's okay but at some point you know if i had to put an a a name age on it i'd say in your 30s at some point you should be able to say okay i am a engineer i will work as an engineer and i will be an employee as an engineer and I will save up money and this is, that's what I'm going to do. And, and so by defining that, you're already committing your time. So how much of your time you have committed will tell you how much time and energy you have for investments. So if you're real honest with yourself, you'll have an answer. Like there are certain types of investments you cannot make because maybe you're too busy at your job making money. So, this is why even though a, a majority of my clients that are, that are wealthier, younger people are self-directed. They, they buy their own stocks, they buy their own real estate, they run buy their own businesses. But I also have many who are not. They just work their job and they <laughs> save as much as possible in retirement accounts. They have an investment advisor who manages larger and larger portfolios outside retirement accounts and they just focus on their job. You know, so I think you have to define it. You have to plan going forward and maybe adjust your plan as things change. Uh, but if you commit to being a W-2 employee, for example, maybe then you will commit, you know, time and money into maintaining that pipeline, into maintaining that network. But if you're someone who 
is working a job and as far as you're concerned in five years you're going to be in your own business you don't really care to know five people who can give you a job that's a completely different path right so so one of the things I, I tell people is as an account I'm expected to preach frugality okay that's everybody expects me to say cut this cut that cut that cut that that's not really my approach um, I think when you're multicultural as we are you have to understand that core values in one place are luxuries elsewhere, right? So a lot of people say, oh, I cut my cable. Um, cable is basic for some people, whereas for other people, having a home is basic, mm. you know? So the most important thing is you need to understand that money doesn't care where you spend it. All it knows is how much do you make and how much do you have left? And then you have to figure out how to achieve those uh, financial results. And you need to know if you're doing something that's keeping you from achieving those financial results, you need to know that before you do it. Don't just do it and then things don't work out and then you feel guilty and then you feel sad because you had no idea that this would happen. Mm. That's, that's how I look at it. You should know. And we're privileged today that a lot of things we can know in advance. I mean, I remember, I'm not that old, but I remember that I was in college before student loan companies had to legally tell you what your monthly payment would be when you graduate. Think about that. Mm. Uh, I was in college. I was in college. I graduated before that was the law. So people were borrowing and had no idea how much of their income they'd be paying when they graduated. That's just not right. So, um, so this year, a year like this, we're pretty busy because this is the year that people are making life or death decisions. And, you know, we have to kind of hunker down and help people understand exactly how much money does this business make before you borrow money for it? Um, exactly how much money do you have before you empty out your retirement accounts because mm. you lost your job? You know, it's a lot of, lot of decisions, but but you can you can do anything you want to be honest, as long as you understand what you're giving up, and it's worth it to you. That's good. That's good. That's what matters most, I think. At the end of the day, <laughs> that's what matters most. It's not you know I work for a lot of rich people, but we don't all have to be rich. Right. Right. Not, that's not a reason for being. Right. Like so. successful financial future is relative to to yeah. you and you. Like, what it's is rel- financially to me is different to you so it's like there is there's four fundamentals to get us mm-hmm. there, but essentially like what you said you know having that goal you know you sit down with yourself you have a reality check to like okay these are my habits this is who i am this is what my goal is this is where i am this is my current net worth mm-hmm. and this is the net worth i'm looking to grow in mm-hmm. 10 years 15 years mm-hmm. you know and kind of just having that together And I think it's important to have a good financial network around you, whether it be um, your accountant, financial advisor, um, understanding that some financial advisors are selling insurance to you and some financial Mm -hmm. advisors are selling you um, (laughs) the actual correct, (laughs) you know. So the term financial advisor is not a regulated term. So everyone should know that. The word financial advisor is not a regulated term. If somebody says they're in the they're an accountant in Texas. That means they have a CPA license, unless that's just a job title in the corporate world. Uh, that means they have a CPA license. That is a regulated term. You have to have met certain criteria and earn this license to call yourself a CPA or you're breaking the law. A financial advisor, anybody can be a financial advisor. You can just say you're a financial advisor. It's not a regulated term. Mm. Now, mo- some financial advisors are stockbrokers. Um, when someone says, hi, I'm, my name is Bob, I'm a financial advisor, Say, well, what licenses, what licenses do you have? Some of the licenses are for selling stocks. Some of the licenses are for selling mutual funds. And some of the financial advisors are what we, what we consider the blue chip, I, I should say, is um, they're fiduciaries. And they manage investments for people. And, and they are licensed investment advisors. But um, so just had to throw that in there because yeah. that's just a, a necessary for a lot of people to know. Yeah. But uh, to your point, I will say this, there's a Nobel Prize winner, I think his name is Kahneman, I can't know if I said it right, who pointed out that we're good at pointing out other people's mistakes. Have you ever noticed that? Off, definitely. 
Exactly. So we're, so we're good at pointing out other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. So in my case, the number one reason I have financial coaching, I give business advice, is my educational background, my professional background is fairly relevant. The most important reason for my clients is that I know more about them than anybody else. Because the reality is that, and I know the truth about their situation, because the reality is that you cannot see yourself like other people see you. Mm -hmm. And so, and we are, we can easily fool ourselves. So I encourage everyone, especially at times like this, don't go making big decisions by yourself. Don't mm -hmm. go do it. Some people will just get an hourly consultation from me. Some people will get weeks of coaching. Some people will get whatever. But the bottom line is whatever, there's something that you can afford that is relevant to you that you can then take with you. Uh, it may be a, a, a person to spouse conversation. It may be a person to sibling or person to parent conversation, but nine times out of 10, somebody else will tell you, yeah, that thing you said you want to do, you know, you're not going to do that. You're not <laughs> really going to do that. You know, that car you want to buy, you know, you don't want that car. You know, I mean, you just feel like you want it right now. Go rent one for 30 days. Get it out of your system. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, we need that. We need that. Um, so th there's, a, there's, that, there's that piece to it because some people are always wondering, you know, like, okay, why am I paying a financial advisor? I'm highly educated. I, I, make, I know how to make all this money and that sort of thing. You know, there's just a second set of eyes. And then you have to wonder about is the person know enough about you uh, to actually be looking at the real you. A lot of people think your life is easier than it is, or you have more money than you have. So when you ask them for advice, they'll give you <laughs> the suggestion based on that flawed reality. You know, uh, I tried to, um, uh, what is it called? I tried to handle, do a lot of things with my kids in this whole period uh, based on advice from someone whose kids are much older than mine. And I realized that, yeah, that, that's a great idea, but it only works when the kid's not one year old, <laughs> you know? So, so, so you need advice um, and you need help from typically from someone else, but someone who actually knows the real you and someone who will keep your secrets. Mm. <laughs> you know, half of it is just, you know, half of it is you're paying me because I'm not part of your social circle and I have no incentive to tell anybody else what you just told me. It's not, it's not going to become a topic for gossip at some point in the future. That's, that's part of it. I mean, I don't want to... important I, because, you know, the finan our financial life is really a private aspect. You know, some parents don't want to tell their kids about how much money they make, you know. Mm -hmm. um, people mm -hmm. don't tell their siblings how much money they make. So to be mm -hmm. able to have a trusted financial mm -hmm. um, consultant who isn't just preparing your taxes, but is actually um, supporting your long-term financial goals. No, it's, it's great that you said that because I, I know someone who, you know, is fairly financially savvy and financially educated too, who's an entrepreneur and investor. And we were talking about some of what I do and this person was baffled. And I said, well, if everyone was like you, I wouldn't have a job. I don't have a job because everybody's like you. If, if, you're, if your parents are very successful business people, you, I'll do your taxes every day, but you'll never have to ask me about how to run a business because you'll just talk to your parents about it. So that's an excellent point that you make is that, yes, your, your first choice should be to look around you for the people in your social circle who can help you. That should be your first choice. Yeah. And then if you don't have those people, you don't trust those people, you don't want to burden them with certain pieces of information because sometimes you trust them, but you don't necessarily want to burden them with certain pieces of information. Then you start to look outside. And when you go outside your social circle, you need to make sure that the person is trained enough that they can gather information quickly about someone they don't know that well, right? So when you go to a doctor, they have things they do to, to tell, they check your vitals and all that sort of thing. They don't know you. That's why they have to have specific steps they go through to make sure that you're alive, right? Mm -hmm. So you go to someone credentialed who can gather that information about you, who can make a reasonable recommendation that is backed up by facts 
reasoning, who can explain it to you. That's part of it. A big part of it is explaining it to you so that you can understand it, so that you can commit to it and see it all the way through. If you can do all those things, you're going to get there. Uh, but um, but to I think to get back to what you asked me earlier, I think most people need a stronger pipeline for work as long as they're working. And um, they need to save, they need to understand that they need to save more. Uh, it's going to, I don't know when you'll start doing it, how you start doing it, but, but I think that our ideas about what kind of house, car, life you live for 40 years and be able to retire are not in sync with reality. They, they really aren't, I'm afraid. Uh, I was disappointed when I found out too, I promise. <laughs> they're, just, they're just not in sync. The, um, the people who get to retire live so much simpler lives <laughs> than, than, uh, than we think we deserve to live. So you really ha we have tough decisions to make individually. That's that's real. That's very real. You know, I think a lot of a lot a lot of people are hoping to become major, like Gary V tomorrow. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean, and get to big levels. So, hopefully, mm -hmm. we're able to balance ourselves and um, be able to take some of these little things and build better habits. You know, um, all of it boils down to habits. You know, yes. And um, hopefully, we're able to to do things to just grow our habits in different ways. Um, but um, I do appreciate your time. I appreciate the major keys that you've given today. And if there's anything, is there anything that we didn't, any questions I didn't ask you that you just feel like you want to just share a, 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 a was it major key? You know? <laughs> <laughs> sound, sound like DJ Khaled. Right, right. Uh, well, I, I think probably the most important thing that is a theme in everything I've said is that we all have to be more business minded. We all have, that's, we just, we just do. We all have to be more business minded and we're not all going to be businesses, but we all have to be business minded and think that way so that we can get by. I think that's, that's the, that's the, that's the theme for me. Mm. You know? I know a lot of people with jobs who know more about business than people and people, people who work in businesses because they're always thinking about, well, I get employed by a business. I need to know when the house is on fire so I can get out. Mm. So um, that's a theme, uh, you know, and, uh, and just don't do it alone. Don't, don't, if you're going to do anything important, just figure out who, what is, what is that other person or two people that'll do it with you. Try not to do anything alone because it usually doesn't work out well. Uh, so don't do it alone. Be business minded. So business minded meaning understanding the financial. Oh well, yeah, Bus business minded means you know um, you have, let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, and if you were a business making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and somebody wanted to, and and uh, if you were going to buy that business. Why would you buy that business? That business doesn't know where its next customer is coming from. Mm -hmm. Why would you buy that business? Right. So, so if that's you, then you need to know where your next customer is coming from. You need to have the next job or two lined up already. And mm -hmm. then that, that way you're a better business, mm -hmm. you know? So in that sense, you know, that's why I talk about the pipeline so much. I think we need to be business minded and, and we'll know when we work for businesses like, yeah, they don't know where their next customer is coming from. I need to leave. I don't need to, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so, um, because inevitably I think every, you know, what we're experiencing right now is another once in a lifetime event. Uh, but God's these things, grace. Oh, God's grace. <laughs> Let this be once you in know, a <laughs> look, I'm an, I'm an elder millennial that I've had two once in a lifetime, uh, recessions in my, in my like adult life. So. Uh, you just hope it's once in a lifetime, right? <laughs> huh? We hope it's once in a lifetime. Well, what I'm saying is I've had two once in a lifetime recessions, right? So mm, this, mm. this is a, this is this is this is expected. This is expected to be a recession. I'm no economic expert, right. but um, but so this is but it's the second one. So right. I don't know once in a lifetime, but I've had two of them. You know, right, right. Uh, so technically, a once in a lifetime event happens every day. So, right, right. But my point is that 
whatever you make for a living, something is going to happen to disrupt it. So you need to have a way to get more work Mm -hmm. if you are still working and you need to have a way to be saving real money, uh, real amounts of money uh, over time. And if you're really good at finding work that can mitigate you not having a lot of savings to a large extent. That's why I emphasize that the most because there's no, there's, if you don't have enough money, there's no, you just have to know how to find work. Um, and most people, just being honest, most people don't have enough money that they can go indefinitely without work, even if they have large savings. It's just not in their best interest to draw them down. Right. So, so that's why I talk so much about the pipeline. I think that's, love it. that's such a huge thing for me. I love it. The pipeline. And that is a major thing in, in major key, course, you know, have you, have pipeline. you need, you need to have your five people who can hire you and pay for what you do. Yeah. You need to know who you need to have at least five people at any time who can hire you and pay for what you do. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. And so where can people find you on social media? Are you active? Uh, I do have a Facebook page for my business. I'm not, I'm not the most active person on social media just because I work so much. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It, it sucks you in, you know, you guys create so much great content. I never get anything done. So, um, <laughs> But, you know, if somebody wants to hire me, my website, alcowboycpa.com, has a phone number on it. Just okay. call and take it from there. Uh, whatever you might need, a resource, service, or anything like that. We we'll wow. do the best that we can. It's a crazy busy time, so bear with us. But try not to make important decisions by yourself. I like that. Okay, so we're going to put your information somewhere around here on the screen. And um, you, as you guys know, thank you guys again. Follow us on We Vibe Network uh, on all social platforms and on Instagram. I am at Shio So Carrie. So thank you so much, Albert, and everybody. Build your pipeline. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for having me.